What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Blacktail, an indie action-adventure title that released just last December that sort of tells the story or legend of Baba Yaga, the witch herself. But to get my usual stuff out of the way right at the beginning, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on YouTube, and while that does include the achievements, it includes a lot more than that as well. And if you're curious about everything that I cover, there's a video linked in the description that explains it, or if you go to my channel, the first thing you're going to see is that same video. Also, my Steam profile is public and linked in the description below as well. Let's talk about Blacktail a little bit. As as I've already mentioned, this tells us the legend of Baba Yaga, or at least an interpretation of it, but it does so through a small open world with some survival crafting elements. That said though, the entire game took a little over 20 hours to 100%, so it's not a terribly long title, and as such this will be a relatively short review. But first and foremost, let's talk a little bit about the story at play here. We are playing as a young woman known as Yaga, who is looking for her missing sister Zora, both of which are orphans that were taken in. Zora is is sort of the more outgoing one who often protected Yaga. Zora has since went missing, and Yaga is out looking for her. However, in addition to Zora, there are several other missing children. And unsurprisingly, all of this of course relates back to Baba Yaga. Now, in spite of the very seemingly clear direction that they're taking this, there are still a few twists and turns. And while I don't really want to spoil it, I did want to mention that I thought it was very well told, and I think a lot of the voice acting for this game in particular was really well done. Though with the sort of gamification of a legend, there was really only so many places they could take the story, but I think they did a really good job with what they had. And I did want to mention here that there are a few points in the story where you're actually doing a bit of light platforming in a sort of 2D side-scroller as something is being described to you, which is a bit different from the normal sequences of open-world action adventure so I wanted to mention it here. From there, though, let's talk difficulty a little bit. There are two, story and normal, and these do exactly what you would expect. Story is very easy, things deal less damage, and take more from you. Normal is a slightly more challenging experience, but even this is relatively easy if you're just going for a story playthrough and not trying to do all of the optional extended content available in the open world. After you pick this at the start of the game, though, you can switch back and forth freely, so it's kind of whatever. Now, I want to talk about a few of the progressive progression systems in the game as well. For starters, there is progression related to the story. These are mainly things that will allow you to traverse the world a little quicker or allow you to get into places you couldn't before, thus opening up more exploration. For instance, you can't leave the first sort of exploration-based area until you learn how to shoot arrows into these sort of obelisks that will then teleport you to them, but that requires a story advancement to actually be able to activate, despite finding the obelisks before that. So there's a few systems like that. And then we have the sort of more standard progression system of your cauldron and brewing potions. A short ways into the story, we find our sort of main hub, which is called the hut. And inside is a cauldron from which we can brew various potions, which will give us upgrades. These potions require certain crafting materials to be found out in the world, which is easy enough, as they are very plentiful. However, outside of the few initial starting skills, you also have to find a page that tells you the recipe for the potion out in the world as well. So you have to find the page to unlock the recipe, and then you still have to brew the potion to then drink the upgrade. And most of the upgrades are what you would expect. Extra inventory space, extra damage, extra arrow type crafting as the primary combat is archery based, and just little upgrades therein. Each upgrade also has a hex type associated with it, which is one of four animals. And once you've unlocked a certain amount of skills per little animal type, you'll unlock the hex for that animal, which will grant you a bonus to certain types of arrows, as well as increasing arrow capacity, a little bit of health, healing effects, that kind of thing, which allows you to customize exactly how you want to play just a little bit, but it is relatively minor. Then we have collectibles. There are a handful of collectibles, as there are in seemingly every open world, but some of these collectibles actually are useful, such as finding the frogs out in the world. If you take them back to the hut in your little garden area, you can then use them to stock up up on free crafting materials every once in a while when you drop back by your hut. One or two of them even give you little temporary buffs, which is a nice touch. If you're going to have collectibles in your game, I do like when the game actually makes them useful, so there's a decent amount of that at play here as well. Lastly, though certainly not least, is the morality system. As you traverse the world, you'll be taking small actions such as helping small animals, harming them, making certain choices in the story, 
that affect your character's morality. And while this isn't like a huge choice and consequence based system or anything, this will provide you with effects and powers that differ a little bit based on whether you're on the light or dark side of that. It's a very simple system, and I certainly don't want to oversell it, but it is here, and it does alter your playstyle a little bit. That, though, brings us to the combat section. Combat consists primarily of archery and magic. You are, of course, playing as Baba Yaga before she actually becomes Baba Yaga, if the name Yaga didn't make that exceedingly clear. But naturally, your combat options are a bit limited as a result, and most of it does boil down to archery and using different types of arrows to attack foes and manage the battlefield accordingly. However, you do get access to a few little bits of magic. There's a sort of AoE spell that you'll get that kind of varies a little bit depending on your morality choices, but this can be a great option for taking out the numerous little enemies that like to swarm you, and then certain enemies later require you to use a magic arrow to break through their sort of crystal barrier. And for the most part, combat is very simple. There's just not a lot to it, though for an indie game with this particular runtime, I think they did a lot with a little. That said, though, because of its sort of limited scope, you do run into a few issues, especially with the more optional content that comes towards the end game when you're dealing with some of the optional bosses that have a lot going on, and your limited field of view can lead you to die in seconds and you not have any idea what killed you because you're getting swarmed by enemies from all sides, and there were a few times where I was killed and I had no idea what had actually killed me, only to be retrying the fight and realize that enemies had swarmed me from behind or from the side, and on the normal difficulty, some of those late game optional bosses have missed minions that can kill you in like two hits. So the combat is mostly okay, but I do think it sort of falls apart a little bit with some of the extra optional content which can lead to a little bit of frustration. But for the most part, considering what the game is, I think the scope of the combat was okay, but it's certainly not going to blow you away. Now that brings me to my favorite part of the game, and that is the world itself. You see, Blacktail has an atmosphere that is simultaneously very vibrant and cheery, and somehow ominous and feels almost out to get you at the same time, which I think is the real standout for this title, is the actual world that it is set in. And I think the very simple morality system really plays into this quite a bit because you'll be able to help some of these more cheerful looking animals, help bees, that kind of thing, and it gives you a positive morality. Or you can lean into that sort of darker undertone and harm these things, which then sort of bleeds into that darker, more sinister vibe that this vibrant world somehow manages to give off. The open world aspect of it, while relatively small, is packed with things to do. The map itself is very content dense, though this does lead to certain areas that are just heavily packed with enemies, which can again lead to a little bit of frustration, mostly if you're just trying to 100% it, this might not be an issue for most people, but if you're doing a lot of that side content, it can be a bit of a slog to constantly be dealing with large packs of enemies over and over again, as this is all packed into a relatively small area. In both the content density as well as the gameplay elements around gathering crafting materials and using them for recipes, etc., you are interacting with the environment a lot which also includes dealing with monsters and enemies and the occasional friendly NPC as well, which makes the world feel alive somehow, even if it is a bit unrealistic in its presentation. Which, you know, is pretty much what you'd expect from a game that is supposed to be telling you a legend or a myth. Beyond that, when it comes to the world, the last thing I want to mention here is that as you're moving through it, you need to be interacting with the shrines pretty regularly, as this is how you save your game. And while the game auto-saves really regularly, it is possible to lose a little bit of progress if you're not paying attention to the shrines. That brings us to Steam Deck compatibility, however, and I'm happy to report here that it is pretty great, which comes as no surprise as the game has a verified on deck rating, though there are a few things I did want to mention here. For some reason, when I first installed this on Steam Deck, in addition to carrying over the cloud saves and everything, it remembered my PC settings, and I had to go in and manually change them to something more acceptable for a Steam Deck to get a consistent frame rate, which was mostly the resolution, which was just a slight oddity I wanted to mention, and beyond that the experience was pretty great. I'm not particularly great myself at playing games like this with a controller, though the game does have controller support and cloud save functionality which leads to a very good experience on the Steam Deck, which I think is great for a game like this because it's relatively short runtime and somewhat simple mechanics as well, lead to a game that feels great to play on the Steam Deck. That, though, brings us to our positives and negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. 
So on the positive side of things, I really enjoyed the visuals, the world, the sort of charming fairy tale land mixed with dark and ominous undertones. I think they did a great job of really nailing that aspect of it. I also really enjoyed the story. I think despite this being a relatively well-known bit of legend or myth around Baba Yaga, they still managed to make it interesting and add a few twists here and there. And it was really fun to engage with that and see it all play out. Now, on the negative side of things, with this being an indie title, it does have a distinct lack of polish here and there, which is especially notable with the occasional bit of jank with the movement and, you know, being able to see enemies that are swarming you from behind, like I mentioned earlier. There's just little things that kind of hurt the experience overall, which brings me to my other negative with the relatively limited combat system. While I think it fits into a game like this fine, it's definitely not great either, as your options are limited, your movement can feel a little slow and clunky at times. Times. And while for story progression, I don't think it's really noticeable, it's a problem that does show its face with the later optional bits of content if you're going for the 100%, though I imagine that won't affect most people. Now, before I wrap this up and bring it to the conclusion, I did want to mention that while I did not personally experience any bugs with the title, I have seen a few reports of some game-breaking bugs related to the story, though they do seem to be relatively rare. But nonetheless, I wanted to mention them before I signed off on this review, so to speak. Which brings us to our conclusion. Overall, I would say Blacktail is a great indie experience. While it's certainly lacking here and there in things like overall polish, etc., the cool things that they did with the story and the world and atmosphere I think more than make up for that, and for the game's $30 asking price, I think they're right around the right ballpark for it. Personally, I would have preferred to see it a little bit cheaper, but I enjoyed it enough that it doesn't really bother me to see it at $30, and this is a game I did pay for. And honestly, if you're not going for the 100%, you're likely to not even run into some of the problems that I personally found, all of which together makes for a game that's pretty easy to recommend, as I certainly enjoyed it. But that has been my review after 100% for Blacktail. I certainly hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.